Testing, testing. Okay. So, so the title of my talk is uh, Board Path Integrals and uh, Bulk Physics uh, Near Beta Equals Zero. Uh, this is work in progress with uh, postdoc Akash Joel and a graduate student at NYU, Xu uh, Yao, uh, uh, who is uh, on the market this year. Um, so what I wanted to do, um, I wanted to report on, this is, this is very much a work in progress towards understanding um, the bulk theory of double scale SYK. Um, uh, and the motivation is that it gives you, well, the, well, the bulk theory in this case is a UV complete uh, theory that uh, you might call a theory of quantum gravity, given that gravity emerges um, in, 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 in some limit, um, or space-time rather emerges in some limit. Um, one of the goals of this research program is, at least the first part, is to see if one can express the, the, the path integral for the bulk in terms of variables that we're familiar with in the, in the gravitational theory at least in some limit that maybe they, you can express it in terms of Einstein-Hilbert plus extra things that would render the theory uh, UV finite. Um, first, just a bit of history, not immediately related to the topic. In fact, if you go back to 1947, to the work of Snyder, the same Snyder of Oppenheimer Snyder uh, collapse, um, he asked the question of whether one can write down a, uh, whether it's consistent to have a discrete or quantized um, uh, theory of space time that preserves Lorentz invariance. Well, well, differently, can you have uh, position and momentum and so on and so forth that satisfies Lorentz algebra, um, but nevertheless, you have discrete representation for position, for example. And he found that the answer is actually yes, you can, you can do something like that, but at the expense of modifying the algebra between X and T uh, and to something like I plus I epsilon, a small number, uh, P squared. Okay. So you add a quadratic term to uh, the Heisenberg uh, algebra, which leads uh, to discrete representations uh, for X. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna go through the details, but I can uh, uh, think to anybody who was interested, maybe something afterwards. Um, Sometime after this, maybe 40 years later, um, right, this was a surprise. Um, people took seriously this, this idea of modifying standard uh, sort of algebras, and they came across a nice uh, way to deform them. Um, uh, which now goes as two deformation of various algebras. Um, and one particular one that uh, we're going to focus on, which is what Henry already, already talked about, is just a Q deform a Heisenberg algebra. Which takes um, any dagger uh, and supposes that that the commutator is not equal to one, but the Q commutator is equal to one. Okay. Um, let me label the A's that satisfy this equation with AQ. 
okay? And you still have a discrete uh, representation here labeled by N. Uh, there's a vacuum that's annihilated by A or AQ, and the number operator uh, eigenvalues is this bracket N that Henry wrote down, which is one minus Q to the M over one minus Q. So these are N, uh, I guess Henry, um, uh, find them as uh, Q deformed integers. Um, so if you if if you want if you want to start your kids uh, you know really early learning uh, you know in quantum gravity learn them how to count in bits. Uh, okay, um, in the Q goes to one limit you get the standard uh, uh, Heisenberg algebra um, a a dagger equals one and um, but if you don't do that. Uh, this thing is called, well, from these creation and annihilation operators, you can define a Q-deformed uh, harmonic oscillator. So I'm gonna call that Q-harmonic oscillator. Um, where the energy levels of this harmonic oscillator has a very interesting behavior. And it goes as one minus Q to the N over one minus Q. And it has an accumulation point as N goes to infinity. So there's a maximum energy at a finite uh, location. If you take Q to one, you get back the, st the standard harmonic oscillator and the energy goes to infinity. Okay, so that's all consistent. Um, why am I mentioning all of this? I forgot how to use this. The reason why I mentioned this is because the Hamiltonian of double scaled SYK is proportional to the, the position operator in uh, the position operator of the Q deformed harmonic oscillator. Uh, so XQ, well, H is equal to this, uh, I guess, times some constant. Uh, was as a q plus a q dash. Okay. This is the bulk Hamiltonian of of, of uh, double scalar. So I think uh, this point I think uh, has already been stressed, or uh, I don't know if it was stressed, but it was mentioned in papers by Per Cruz at all. Um, and the q in this theory, as Henry mentioned, t to the minus lambda, where lambda goes as P squared over N, P is the number of fermions that interact in each term of the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian, I guess this, this uh, gamma here, uh, uh, let me not say what it is yet, uh, still, but it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna depend on lambda in some way. Okay. Um, this, this, so the spectrum um, is a finite range, H of theta, well, let me just say, I guess, just what, um, the energy eigenstates can be labeled by a not an angle of theta, and the energy uh, goes uh, parameterized in this way as a function of theta. It has a finite range. Okay. It's continuous, and I th that's simply an artifact. Well, it's because you've averaged. Just that's how I understand it. Um, there's another basis that you can express the Hamiltonian in, which is the, uh, the length basis Henry talked about. So N is a bulk length basis. Um, and the important thing here is, well, let me say two things. The reason why these are the, why she call these the length uh, bulk base, uh, a length bulk basis is Henry stressed. And if you compute the two point function, the ML, MR, it's, uh, there's a diagram for this, N chords here, N chords here, and you have um, uh, this, the, the, the correlator just counts how many, um, how many Hamiltonian chords you intersect. And this is gonna be equal to just um, E to the minus, uh, uh, N times lambda 
are P of the matter, the number of fermions in the matter field, uh, uh, divided by P the number of fermions in the Hamiltonian. When expressed in this way, this term here, uh, the number of cores times lambda, you should think of the length. And this ratio of the P's, you should think of it as the dimension of uh, the matter field. The Hamiltonian in this uh, basis, again, as Henry, as Henry discussed, um, it's minus one over lambda uh, times e to the i k one minus e to the minus and lambda plus square root one minus e to the minus and lambda e to the minus i k. Okay, and the wave functions. Um, the, the energy wave functions in the n basis or the n wave functions in the, in the energy basis, they go as there's some um, a measure factor, let's say, let's call it, and it involves Q deformed um, Hermite polynomial okay? divided by a Q deformed uh, Pock hammer symbol. Oh, Q Pock. Um, so everything I said so far, these are just uh, uh, really uh, preliminaries. Um, the path integral that we want to study is the following. We want a path integral for the following uh, transition amplitude. Path integral for zero e to the minus beta h zero. So it's a path integral of starting with zero chords evolving for some Euclidean time and then, and then annihilating it again. Um, you, could, you could also consider the case of, of starting with some finite number of chords and then ending with an, uh, a, a, another uh, finite number of chords. Um, the first path, in, path integral you can write is in the energy basis. That's just called a partition function. And you get a measure factor um, that, uh, which comes from the overlap of um, the vacuum and uh, the space in the, in the energy basis, um, uh, which is just going to be equal to mu of theta times e to the minus beta e. Okay, nothing special there. If you were to express the path integral in terms of the L basis, then you'll get so the L, so the, or so this is the N or L basis. So the path integral is just simple. Uh, this guy, e to the integral um, i k over lambda L dot minus some constant two cosine k times square root of one minus uh, e to the minus L. Here, my, the L variable I'm defining is lambda times the discrete N. And I'm imagining for the moment, I'm working in the small lambda regime. Um, so while N is discrete, you can think of L being continuous. Okay. Um, let me talk about one more basis, which I'm going to call the canonical uh, X and P basis. Okay. So the, the, um, you can, uh, the idea is to express, express the creation, the Q deform creation and annihilation operators in terms of position and momentum operators that in the limit as Q goes to one would be the position and momentum of the harmonic oscillator. Okay? I'm trying to, I want to express the, the Hamiltonian and the path integral of this theory in terms of X and P they, that, that uh, are analogous to X and P in the harmonic oscillator. And you can get that with the following, trans, with the following um, 
uh, parameterization of the of these ladder operators e to the two pi alpha x minus e to the minus alpha p e to the minus i alpha x divided by minus i to the root one minus q and a q dagger is just a dagger of that. Um, why is this useful? Um, The path integral is actually much simpler uh, in this in this case. Um, so, uh, first of all, the Hamiltonian. I guess maybe. I The Hamiltonian in this basis is again with some constant omega times sine of two alpha x. Oh, I guess I should have said that alpha is L over is uh, square root of L over two, of lambda over two. Um, we have a sine. We have um, e to the alpha squared sine of alpha x plus i alpha squared over two times e to the minus to the minus uh, alpha p. Expressed in this way, well, with this Hamiltonian, the path integral will become following. There's going to be an integral over initial and final um, uh, values of x, um, or initial and final wave functions of x. And then standard p. Well, I guess I we got the circ here. There are going to be these wave functions, which turn out to be just Gaussians. So this is simple. Times uh, just the usual thing, integral e tau from zero to theta of i p x dot uh, minus the Hamilton. Okay. The reason why this, this uh, formulation is simpler is because um, uh, you can do a canonical transformation and make the Hamiltonian make, make the Hamiltonian much simpler. In particular, you can take uh, p to p plus any function of x. That's a canonical transformation, and you can remove this factor of psi. Okay. And so then the path integral. I guess I can write it down. Uh, let me just write down the the Lagrangian. Um, it's going to be, I guess, i p dot x uh, minus some constant, write that omega, sine to alpha x uh, minus e to the minus uh, alpha p. Okay. So the so the x dependence completely uh, factors out or is is not multiplied by the p dependence. Oops, p dot uh, x dot. Um, you can actually do the p. You can you can integrate out p exactly. Okay, uh, you, you you just get a gamma function of x dot. Um, and so uh, so that's one of the advantages. Another advantage is that the equation of motion is actually pretty simple for this for this action. I'm not going to write it down. Um, the the only bad thing is the physical interpretation is not so clear. So of what this x and p is in terms of the chords and, and all the nice things that Henry was uh, talking about. Okay, so that's that was um, basically the story of, of path integrals. Next, I'm going to talk about the bulk physics near beta equals zero. So beta equals zero uh, corresponds to the case where, at least if you think about this from JT gravity, the case where the boundary curve is extremely small. And some people who shall go unnamed have made claims that you might get desitter space there or something. And so we wanna want to analyze that region. 
So you want to look at study the beta uh, approximately zero bulk. Um, I'm going to focus uh, on the limit of lambda much less than one. Oh, I should also say that the results of this section will be taken with a lump of salt because some of the results we found literally just on Friday, last Friday. So what happens when you teach? Okay. Um, okay. So, um, okay. Uh, so notice that the path integral is, um, well, the, 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 the states that we're, we're uh, well, the path integral that we've been just talking about here is, is one where you start with the zero length state and you evolve for some beta and then you, you project again on the zero state. But if, you, but if beta is small, this means that you're not gonna be too far away from the zero length state. So the, so the idea here is that when you're near beta equals zero, you're, you're looking at uh, uh, the subspace of states where the length is very small. So, um, so small evolution uh, based off of zero and the zero. Um, so focus on um, L is equal to N times lambda being very small, okay? Uh, now, What's nice about this limit is that um, the, so these, these Qs that appear in the Hamiltonian, they're only important when you consider states that have large M. Because so Q, so the, the way that Q enters the Hamiltonian is via Q to the N. But if N here is small and lambda is small, then you can approximate this thing with just one. Okay? So we're assuming that we're only interested in states where this, where Q to the N can be approximated by one. Hence, the bulk Hamiltonian in this regime is just gonna be one over lambda times A plus A dagger, which is just the X operator of the harmonic oscillator. Okay. So what this says is that, that this, this very quantum gravity regime is secretly there even in the hydrogen atom. I think we should write a nature article about that. <laughs> and uh, the path angle for this system is also simple as you can imagine. That wasn't a jab on this uh, wormhole stuff. It's really cool stuff. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the path integral is just going to be something like this easy. Yeah. A uh, L dot over lambda minus two constant cosine K with lambda uh, with the boundary conditions that L of zero is equal to L of beta is equal to zero. And just this past Friday, Xu Yao managed to solve the on-shell equations, um, the on-shell solution of this action. And the result is that L goes as tau uh, times beta minus tau. Notice that we were saying that um, um, L roughly goes as L roughly goes as lambda, um, which means that uh, that beta goes as square root lambda or smaller. Okay? Uh, for 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 this for the regime of for these equations to be applicable. Um, this uh, solution is extremely weird. Um, I was, for, for, for uh, the past few days, I was trying to figure out what kind of space time would lead to distances of this form. So here, um, 
let's say we have a circle with some very small radius. Um, this length here could be, for example, if you choose the tau right, the length between two points, let's say, some, ge some geodesic length between two points uh, starting and ending on the boundary. Um, it seems reasonable to assume that uh, when beta is, beta is very small, that maybe here you you have a you have a you just have a patch of flat space. But if this was a patch of flat space, then the then the distance between these two points would go as sine of the angle between them, which is roughly tau, the sine tau, which would be uh, which would involve only odd powers uh, of tau. And so on and so forth. So it seems like uh, this 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 point was uh, emphasized to me by uh, by Henry that this it, it seems like because they, they've also been analyzing this in a similar uh, limit that um, the space time cannot be described by a Riemannian geometry okay because we're not reproducing this result even for very small angles. Um, Okay, I'll give an explanation. Well, one explanation for why this uh, this answer and sort of, uh, how you can make sense out of it. And for that, first, let me let's uh, switch gears and analyze the same uh, um, region. Uh, with the same physics, but using correlation function. So let's compute correlators near beta equals zero. Um, let's. Uh, uh, first, what are the rules? The rules here are very simple. They're, they're much simpler than those discussed by Henry because when you have H uh, intersections between Hamiltonian chords or space-time chords, you have no penalty factor. You just get a one. But suppose you have uh, a matter field, Mi, intersection between the, well, not matter field, matter, or just a particle. Uh, when it intersects with H, uh, I can represent that with something like this. It's I and solid line is the Hamiltonian chord. You get, Qi, which is e to the minus lambda pi over p. And for mi, mj, you get uh, U, qij, which is e to the minus lambda pi over p, pj over p. Another rule is that when you have when you compute the overlap between two L states, uh, you need to you need to sum over all possible ways of them joining. But because there is no penalty factor for intersecting space-time uh, ports, this thing is just L factorial. I guess I should use n n factorial. Okay, so these are the rules. Uh, Let's, so, so let's say we want to compute the two-point function. Um, so the way you do it, the two points, you're, so you start with a state zero, uh, we end with a state zero, and we're gonna have a matter particle going through. Um, the way to do this is to first break up this calculation into, um, so, um, you first you you first um, think about the state. You think about preparing a state of definite length here. Uh, so, L plus a superposition of, of length with with some alpha L. No, I can switch from that. And M. and there's also n prime alpha n prime uh, n prime and. From the rules, we know what the what the, um, what the overlap is, or rather, what, what the two-point function is in a state of definite n. 
And so we can calculate this and we get uh, E to the minus one minus, let's say this is particle number one, uh, one times tau beta minus tau divided by uh, lambda. Okay. Um, which now, if, let's let's say we take uh, q to be uh, small, uh, or not small, very close to one, then this becomes e to the minus delta uh, tau of beta minus tau. Okay. This is the limit as uh, I guess lambda delta is much less than one. Okay, so. Uh, this is what the two-point function is. Um, by uh, differentiating with respect to log of, of, of uh, q1, you can compute the x. Okay, you can imagine from this correlator, you can compute the moments of the length, the number of chords that this, the, the, the number of, the dominant number of chords, well, just, just the moments of the number of chords uh, uh, on this time slice. Uh, you, and you do that by just differentiating with respect to log q, and then taking Q goes to one, okay? Um, because roughly speaking, the thing that we're computing really is just this. Uh, and, and, then, and then taking Q goes to one. And what you find is um, expectation value of N uh, uh, is just uh, tau beta minus tau over lambda, okay? So, uh, um, or uh, let me let me just put an L here. So this is now the length, okay? Um, but if you compute the, the, the variance, you find, uh, so let, let me just say, uh, oh, sorry. So this thing goes as tau beta minus tau. So this means that this, this secretly goes as lambda. The variance, Actually, if you, if you do the calculation, you find that it goes as square root lambda. We're working in the small lambda regime, and hence, um, hence the fluctuations are larger than the sigma. Okay, so it's really a quantum regime, and um, uh, so we had no right to expect that the, that the lengths would reproduce those by uh, of a Riemannian uh, space time, like a given Riemannian space time, to be a superposition of them though. Um, and the final thing I was going to talk about is computing the OTOC. Um, that also is a simple calculation that can be done along the same lines as the two-point function calculation. So here's the OTOC. So we put four operators, one, two, one, two. And the way that you organize the calculation is, again, you break up uh, these four uh, quadrants. Okay. Um, so you, you start from the vacuum here, the vacuum here, the vacuum here, and the vacuum here. That prepares for you some state of L chords here, L chords here, and so on and so forth, here and here. Um, and then you can organize it in terms of the number of chords that get contracted with the ones here, uh, or between this guy and this guy, and this guy and this guy, and all possible ways of uh, connecting them. Um, it's just a, it's just a uh, uh, problem in uh, uh, combinatorics. It's not too hard to do. and um, uh, the only thing you need to take into account is uh, how many times you intersect the matter chord, okay? because because th that's the only thing that gives you a um, these penalty factors. And the answer you get is uh, the following: q one two from the intersection between the two matter chords is e to the minus. I know it is dramatic. One, one, two, times t squared minus uh, beta t over two 
divided by lambda. The right power of lambda here, I'm actually not 100% sure, okay? But right now, this is what I'm settled on, one factor of lambda here. And uh, let's say we're in the regime where we can uh, 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 we'll approximate this thing by each one by lambda times delta. So this is gonna be lambda squared times delta one, delta two, okay? And just, just to get like a, um, uh, a kind of, uh, uh, a rile out of you guys. Let's take lambda squared uh, times delta delta over lambda to be order one. Okay. Let's choose delta such as our school. So delta would go as one over squared root lambda. Then in that case, you would get something like e to the minus t squared, which by some definition you can call hyperfast scrambling. Okay. Just because after, after an order one amount of time, the, this OTOC would be, uh, would have significantly diminished. Um, um, and the, the, you know, there's a question of what is the interpretation of that? Are you, is it, are you in the sitter? Um, what is the temperature here? I don't know. Um, but uh, I think that maybe the, the more accurate interpretation, although, although it's not clear in what I said so far, that you, you're maybe just extremely close to the event horizon um, of, uh, of the black hole. That's why it's not one plus one over n times e to the minus, e to the minus e to the plus t. It's just this thing by itself. Um, so yeah, so this might be hyperfast scrambling and uh, I'll be happy to take your, your questions. Thank you so much. High temperature limit of the thing that I was discussing at the end. So, like uh, in your formula for the two point function, it matches the standard large Q two point function when you just take that. Okay. Is that a fact are you asking? It seems to me that if you expand one over sine squared, you just get this thing. Okay. I have not compared. Uh, I hope to do so this week. It's a different scaling of two. Okay. He said, uh, Tosh said, uh, it's a different scaling, so maybe not. So you're taking the limit where uh, the number of cores is held fixed. Is that correct? Um, I want 10 times, pretty much a 10 Any other questions? Yeah. These core uh, rules that you mentioned, you just derive them from the action that you mentioned. The rules for correlation functions, you just derive, derive them from the action. Uh, you can derive them from the action, but there's a more direct way uh, along the lines of what Henry talked about. Um, yeah, so I guess Douglas in the KITP talk reproduced the core expansion from the Liouville action. Do you expect it to match your action somehow with the Liouville action at some point? Okay. Uh, yeah, I hope to do that. It's only this last Friday. <laughs> <laughs> So if there's no other questions, let's uh, thank Ahmed again.